Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. My name is Noelle and I review and unbox subscription boxes here on my channel. And today I have another book box to share with you in my ongoing quest to get all caught up on the book boxes that have accumulated here in my office over the past couple of years. I will probably still be getting caught up in the new year with the boxes that I've received in October, November, and December, but that is why you're seeing so many of them right now. I just figured it's the perfect season to get caught up on some reading in the fall and winter months when we're spending a little bit more time inside and especially with this book subscription that I have to share with you today which you will be seeing quite a bit of because I have almost a year's worth to go and that is Down the Rabbit Hole book box. This was sent to me actually for photography but also for reviews so I'm so glad that I've had the opportunity to start to work through these because I think they do a really good job. So yes in case you couldn't already tell these are darker reads so we get a mixture of thrillers, sometimes Sometimes there's even a little bit of horror which is not really one of my genres but I do love some mystery um, and they are not necessarily all new books which is nice sometimes they do some more like class classics like Agatha Christie for example. The box is $49.99 per month. That does include the shipping and I do have a code for you. It is Noel15. That should save you 15%. The box that I'm sharing with you today, still the same beautiful dark blue box but this is actually I believe, let me double check, the November 2021 <laughs> box. So yes, I'm an entire year behind, but I will say the most recent box that I have right here is actually the September 2022 box, so not quite a full year. The book that was included for this one was These Violent Delights by Micah Nemerever. Now, I was a little bit confused because around the same time, another book by the same title, which of course comes from Romeo and Juliet from Shakespeare, uh, also came out and it had sort of a Romeo and Juliet retelling. There is an element of Romeo and Juliet in this one as well which is I think where the name came from but it's actually more based on a true crime story that a lot of you if you're a true crime aficionado will know which is the crazy story of Leopold and Loeb so there's a little bit of that in the retelling of this book now it was a giant book. This was a big, hefty, hefty book, and I definitely, um, it was a little bit of a speed bump in my reading mission. I think it was like about 450 pages, and I did think that this is a debut novel, I believe. Let me double check, but I thought the writing was gorgeous. It was very, very smart. It's clearly from the mind of someone who is an academic, like the theories that they're talking about, the topics they're talking about, uh, just the use of language is stunning. I did find it a little bit slow in the first half, just because I was really ready for that Leopold and Loeb Loeb kind of retelling, but I also understand that they had to sort of spend a lot of time on the character development and specifically the very, very obsessive relationship that happens in this book and that is what I think the book is really all about. Um, so not to be confused with the other one with the same title that came out around the same time, but it's about this, um, it, it's, a, it's queer literature, so it's about these two 17 year olds who basically become romantic but they're so codependent and so infatuated and obsessed with one another and trying to prove their love to one another and then there's also just this element of like how they ex how their whole relationship is really defined by violence even the way they talk about being like soulmates is that it's they were split in two so there's these the scar that they're trying to fix but the way they try to fix it is through violence they uh their intimate moments are are colored with violence it's just it's a it's a violent book but in all honesty i sort of wanted a little bit more of the actual crime violence to happen a little sooner in the book because then when that does happen in like the last third it all feels kind of rushed all of the actual um, sort of investigation part once they actually do commit a crime. So spoiler there, you guys, there is a crime. So what I'm going to do is read the blurb for you so you can hear about these uh, star-crossed lovers. Um, and uh, then I will read the passages that are associated with the gifts. I think there were four gifts in this one. And um, you can decide it for yourself if you want to read it. So we did get a nice little bookmark, of course, that says, He couldn't stand to look at the truth even now. All they were, all they had ever been, was a pair of sunflowers who each believed the other was the sun. I didn't even see this, and I do remember thinking that that was a really striking sentence. 
And then, of course, we have from William Shakespeare, These violent delights have violent ends, and in their triumph die like fire and powder, which as they kiss consume. The sweetest honey is loathsome in its own deliciousness, and in the taste confounds the appetite. And then we always have our little pamphlet from Down the Rabbit Hole, so I believe there's usually a playlist. I don't know if I have that playlist. It's probably in the book somewhere. And again, this is... So Micah Namorever was trained as an art historian. He wrote his master's thesis on queer identity and gender anxiety in the art of the Weimar Republic. Wow. So I will say um, that this it takes place in 1970s Pittsburgh. So uh, I appreciated that even though this could be considered queer literature that they didn't spend like a ton of time on that like it wasn't really a coming out story um, it wasn't necessarily like erotic literature so for those of you who like shy away from that it wasn't that either it was really just about their relationship so I liked that it was more about their relationship and not just about them being gay I, I appreciated that it says Nemrever is an avid home chef and amateur historian of queer cinema uh, let's see what else it, it does say yes it is loosely inspired by homicidal duo Leopold and Loeb. So if you haven't looked those guys up, that is quite the uh, true crime story. So this is what that looks like, of course. And then we have some like reviews and stuff of the novel, which overall has very good reviews. I do love the thread, the sort of leitmotif of chess. I I'm one of those people who doesn't get chess. I wish I did. It feels like something that I should have learned in all my many years of schooling, but um, I did like it. And you do, if, this, this is my main spoiler. If you do decide to read this, pay attention to the moments that chess comes up because the sort of like end image and I think the uh, the the way that metaphor kind of gets tied up is is linked to chess. So I think you will have a better understanding of what the ending means. Because I know in some of the reviews that I saw, people were like, "I'm not really sure what happened at the end," which is kind of interesting when a book like this with this much uh, exposition. Like I feel like you should know what happens. All right, so it says, The secret history meets lie with me in this Hitchcockian tale of two college students, both with troubled pasts, whose escalating obsession with each other will radically alter the course of their lives. So it is a remainder book. It is a hardcover book, though, so I appreciate that. When Paula enters university in early 1970s Pittsburgh, it's with the hope of moving past the recent death of his father. Sensitive, insecure, and incomprehensible to his grieving family, Paul feels isolated and alone. When he meets the worldly Julian in his freshman ethics class, Paul is immediately drawn to his classmate's effortless charm. Paul sees Julian as his sole intellectual equal, an ally against the unconventional world he finds so suffocating. Paul will stop at nothing to prove himself worthy of their friendship because with Julian, life is more invigorating than Paul could have ever imagined. But as charismatic as he can choose to be, Julian is also volatile and capriciously cruel, and Paul becomes increasingly afraid that he can never live up to what Julian expects of him. As their friendship spirals and into an all-consuming intimacy, they learn the, the lengths to which the other will go in order to stay together, their obsession ultimately hurling them toward an act of irrevocable violence. I love that word and I can never say it. Unfolding with propulsive veracity, these violent delights is an exquisitely plotted excavation of the depths of human desire and the darkness it can bring forth in us. So I did think it was a good book. It was interesting, but like I'm telling you, they, they kind of gave us a teaser in the beginning. Um, they gave us a teaser in the beginning of the actual crime in the prologue. So I was like, after the first five pages, I was already like to get into that. And then we like go throw back all the way to the, the them meeting and like why they, why they fall in love with each other and how charismatic they are. It is interesting because by the end, you don't think of Paul. At first you think of him as being the vulnerable one and Julian's like the rich kid that's taking advantage of him and manipulating him. And in the end, it kind of does flip and you're like, oh, I don't trust Paul. I think Paul is actually using Julian. So that was my take on it. We did get a little extra. Sometimes we get extras in this box. And this time around, it was some seven sharpened pencils. And it says, we're the same kind of crazy. So it says, we're the same kind of crazy. Friends are the therapists you can drink with. That's a horrible idea. What time? Friends don't let friends do stupid stuff alone. You had me at, well, we'll make it look like an accident. And I take a Nerf bullet for you. And we're more than friends. We're really a small gang. So just really fun, um, kind of violent friendship pencils. That's fine. 
So the first one came on page seven, so very early on. Now this was a gift where honestly, I don't think it had anything to do with the passage. So um, it was just the end of the prologue. So you'll see what I'm talking about, but this is what it usually looks like when you get to one of the sticky notes. And then you have to go into the box and find the corresponding gift. So it was gift number one. And I like reread the page a couple of times and I was like, I don't get how it goes with this. So I think this was just a like, you're getting started, let's get into this book uh, gift, honestly. They do have a thermos, but it's with like chicken noodle soup. So maybe that's what it has to do with, but we got some coffee. We got some coffee and tea, uh, Door County coffee, which I know some of you guys is like, has a cult following. So we got some mistletoe mocha, lovely. It's, I think it probably has a date on it, but hopefully I, uh, can use it in time. It's it's sealed. And we got some gingerbread spice latte. So see, it pays off that I waited for an entire year to uh, go ahead and do this. Oh, so yes. Okay, so here, there's the card in here that I didn't say. It says, no, this isn't chicken and rice soup. It's coffee. Don't worry. You can totally trust what we offer you to drink because, spoiler alert, that chicken and rice coffee um, will not make you feel so good if you drink it. So... And let's see. I don't I don't actually see the page where he says it. Let's see. We'll have to go back. So it's not it was on the last page of it, but it's not actually the chicken and rice uh, passage. But it says uh, the other boy reaches across Charlie's knees and takes a thermos from the glove box. The contents smell of hot broth and rosemary, something Charlie's grandmother might have made when he was sick as a child. Want some? The boy asks. It's chicken and rice. Nice of you, Charlie agrees. He holds the metal thermos mug steady while the boy carefully fills it. The first mouthful burns Charlie's tongue, but it shocks the cold from his bones and it tastes all right. At first there's the barest tang of soap, as if the mug wasn't rinsed properly, but after a moment, he can't even taste it. Yeah, he should have. It wasn't soap, but it wasn't uh, chicken and rice soup either, <laughs> so bummer. All right, next we had a gift on page 52. Let's see. All right, so Paul and uh, Julian are hanging out a lot, and uh, Julian's family, not a fan. Paul's family, a little iffy on it, but they're trying their best to be supportive because Paul's kind of a weirdo anyway. He seems like a sweet boy. Yeah, said Audrey. That's his sister. There was a smile in her voice, but an arch one. Seems. That kid's trouble. He didn't linger. He followed Julian into the snowy streets, sprinting to catch up. Julian didn't stop walking as he lit himself a cigarette. For a moment, he left the match lit, and he brushed his fingertips over the flame, one after the other, just quickly enough not to burn. Then he shook the match cold and flicked it into the gutter. Julian's hands were bare despite the chill, but he was wearing a new scarf, courtesy of a care package from his mother, camel-colored, some kind of exotic wool, softer than anything Paul had ever touched. All right, so that is gift number two. Came in this little mailer bag, of course. And this was a good gift, I thought. We got a camel-colored scarf, of course. Nice and soft. It is really soft. It's probably acrylic. I don't see a tag on it. But I thought, I mean, that's like a literal translation. So, yes, ooh, it's 20% cashmere, 80% viscose, Italy design. It does say dry clean or hand wash only. But it is very, very soft, and it is a very usable color. So, for me, that's like my favorite when it is a gift that totally goes with the page, but also is something I can easily use in my daily life. All right, so now we are at Julian's family home and they are not happy to uh, see Paul because uh, he was not supposed to be there. And so he sort of arrived without them expecting him. And then Henry is the uh, brother. So I haven't done anything, Paul replied and told Henry silently that he was luckier for it. Henry made an impatient, miserable sound and dragged one hand irritably through his hair. The gesture was an another uncanny likeness to Julian, and Paul quickly focused his gaze on Henry's wrist to avoid dwelling on it. He'd never known before that it was all right in some circles for a man to wear any kind of bracelet. It was reasonably masculine, a loop of plated leather fastened with a brass anchor, but it was still strange enough that it helped Paul forget all the ways Henry was familiar. So we have gift number three, probably guessing. So we got some leather bracelets and we actually got matching ones so that you could share. Actually, I think one's brown and one's black. I forget. I did open these like a while ago before I read the book. So we got this. I think it's like a magnetic closure or how does this close? I don't remember. So here is the leather bracelet. Pretty masculine in all honesty. Um, not like my kind of style bracelet. You guys know I'm not like a corded jewelry person. If I could just figure out how to open it, I don't really remember how. 
maybe it'll come to me when I open the identical one that is in brown. So this is kind of cool because this particular box could definitely be enjoyed by a, a guy as well, because obviously a guy can enjoy some coffee. That scarf is not a gendered scarf by any means. Oh, it slides open. So see? told you I just had to open the other one so it does have a little bit of a magnetic closure but it slides closed so it's gonna be nice and fitted I mean it's cool I it's not my style it's a little like biker it's a little masculine but you know it's a cool gift and uh, it's definitely a book about friendship and relationships so you could definitely share one with a friend like I'm gonna wind up putting this on and not be able to take it off so anyway that's how it goes on I don't know that I would wear them but I could definitely re-gift it to someone else or it might make an appearance in a giveaway but decent quality in all honesty for some fashion jewelry that's kind of got that tough tougher edge I'm trying to figure it out there we go i got it on you guys yay <laughs> and then the last one didn't come until 298 now i will say 298 you know that's pretty far in but then we still had to get to page two 450 so that was like another 150 pages with no no gifts in sight but that's right around where the story kind of picked up and I was like let's get to the crime I've like never I've you know it's one of those books where you keep reading because you're like get to the crime <laughs> get to the crime that you were like sh showing me about in the first five pages and then you just totally dropped it so it says Oh, let's see. I'll have to read this whole thing just so you get some of it. So the final phrase of the project was not a killing, certainly not a murder, but an endgame. The code name fit better anyway because a murder necessitated a victim. An endgame had only victor and defeated, and even those were beside the point. It was a coup de grace born of pure reason that could only live by destroying. The subject, now that he'd been chosen, was no longer the subject. He was our friend, a friend whose voice they had never heard, glimpsed only from a distance through Paul's binoculars. They'd circled one name in the end there was no need to say it out loud audrey again sister was the only one who could see any change in them she took to asking where they were going though paul's mother was content to let julian whisk him away for hours without explanation you always hated it when dad asked you paul pointed out but she only shrugged and replied that she was curious now and then some fra fragment of dinner table conversation would remind them of the project and they would fall into a nervous laughter that made audrey raise her eyebrows she might not be able to name it but she was the only person who could tell a secret was there see she seized the chance to confront him the first time they were home to alone together she hadn't planned it paul could tell when she heard him descending the basement stairs with a basket of laundry there was a note of alarm in her voice hello paul paused midway down the staircase a pungent sandalwood smell rose from below from the candles audrey liked to burn to cover up the smell of grass he rolled his eyes and continued downward it's just me he said ma's still out silence paul thought a rather chastened one he spotted audrey pass the cloth curtain over the laundry room doorway she was putting on a record and staunchly pretending there was nothing of interest between her thumb and her forefingers so she burns candles to hide the smell of weed so we have a gift it is not weed <laughs> it is uh not a candle and i was like i was thinking when i first uh got the box i was like oh we get a candle but it's in this like kind of flat bag so it is not it is some incense so i'm not i'm not sure if it's sandalwood incense but i'm guessing that it is but we got a whole tube of incense and we got a really pretty and simple um it, incense holder so this is kind of a cool one so here it is it's in like wood it kind of looks like cherry wood or something but here it's just got this little like little lever that you uh go ahead and poke up and then there's a hole there so that you can have the incense float above this and then of course the ash falls in there so I thought that was kind of a cool interpretation of the sandalwood it's not like a particularly like memorable moment so that's why I read from so far behind where you hear how callous they are about talking about their friend and they just have these like goofy little inside jokes about their friend who they are uh, targeting um but you know it was still like a good way of interpreting and giving us a gift so we got two packets of dora county coffee we got our lovely scarf the scarf is definitely my favorite item in this box <coughs> we got our two leather quarter bracelets i'm not sure if it's real leather but we got two of them which is kind of fun and then finally we got our incense and 
this guy. Now I'm not sure if this pass box happens to be available, but if you are interested, I do think the book is worth a read just because it is beautiful. I know the topic might not appeal to everyone, but if you are interested in sort of a very strange retelling where they really get into the psyche of the characters, um, and it, it's it's an interesting way of telling the story. It, it does drag a little bit in the beginning, but I do think it gets good in the end. I hope you all enjoyed this video. I would super duper appreciate a thumbs up. I know for some of you it's kind of tedious to get through these book box unboxings, but I promise very soon we'll be all caught up and I will see you all very, very soon in my next unboxing.